I will start right now. So uh, welcome uh, everybody tonight. We're really excited about this. If you were on our webinar yesterday, this is the same webinar. We offer it once during the day and then once during the evening. So welcome back, uh, but this will be recorded and be available for people to watch also at a later date off of our website. So I'm really happy tonight uh, to have a great friend that's on here. Uh, Zach is a great friend, very knowledgeable, uh, great successful beekeeper who I think always has his finger on the pulse of what's going on. And I think that's a lot of what you're gonna hear tonight. Very accomplished public speaker. And I think he's one of the smartest people that I know. And I guess I would start this out by telling you that Zach and I have had many, many long conversations about the sustainability of beekeeping. I find it to be just a fascinating discussion that always leads to more and more questions. And one of the things that I learned really, really early on that I think we'll be re-emphasizing tonight is that the things that are going on related to beekeeping and the sustainability of beekeeping are the same things that are going on for all kinds of species that are out there on the landscape. So if your interest is in grassland songbirds, monarch butterflies, native bees, food sustainability, pheasants, quail, soil health, water quality, the things that we're gonna talk about tonight really are connected to and touch all of those things. So we've asked Zach to provide um, a perspective because he has a really unique perspective. His family has been involved in uh, beekeeping for multiple generations. I'll let him tell you that story. And he's going to talk about how things have changed over the years, the decades, and provide his perspective on what he often calls forage. And I, as a wildlife biologist, call habitat. The same thing. So with that, we're going to jump right into it because we want to uh, spend most of the time hearing what Zach has to say. So Zach, if you would, lead us out. All right, thank you, Pete. Get this uh, screen to function for me here. Thank you for the very warm welcome. There we go. <clears throat> Well, I've known Pete for, for several years and we have had lots of long conversations. So this should probably for the two of us be pretty natural. Uh, but for all of you who don't know me, um, uh, welcome. And I'm glad that you're able to join us tonight. I'm a commercial beekeeper. I am currently living in Jamestown, North Dakota and it's very, very cold tonight. Um, my family's been in, in beekeeping for a long time as, as Pete mentioned. We specialize in honey production, crop pollination, and we do a little bit of retail bottling. This photo is uh, what some of my hives look like. And this next photo is my grandfather on the left and my father on the right. This, this was, uh, I wanna say about 1979. So at that point, we were, you know, 50 some years into, into the business. And, and um, now we're actually introducing the sixth generation of, of Browning family members into this business. So we have some little guys out there donning bee veils and carrying smokers and hype tools around. Um, so we've seen a lot over the years. This thing doesn't seem to be functioning right tonight. Sorry about that. Any ideas, Pete? Here it is. Sorry for the technical difficulties. Um, this photo is my brother and I, again in the 70s. It was a very simple time in beekeeping. Uh, my father kept bees in the same locations winter through summer. And these two photos kind of emphasize what it looked like. They, uh, they were long rows of bees. 
In the winter time, we would slide them together and put some straw and plastic coat over, over them. We called it a winter pack, and, and that's how we uh, cared for them over the winter. And then the spring, we pull that off and spread them out again, and, and we'd start uh, getting them ready for the honey season. The winters were free time for sledding or ice fishing, whatever else we were able to do. Um, there was no, no interest at that point in taking bees. Um, into other states or doing other jobs. It was just simple honey production. But like all good things, they have to come to an end, right? So over the years, land use changed in Southeast Idaho. And that meant that we saw a lot of diminished habitat. And, and I have come to terms with, with the idea that what I call forage is, is uh, more commonly referred to as habitat. So within this talk, I have referred to all of it as habitat. Um, but we saw reduced honey yield as a result, and that was our economic driver. Um, so it, it, was, it was troublesome. And it came in the form of changing farming methods. And a lot of that was just increased efficiency. And with that efficiency meant quicker harvest. It meant um, you know, better, um, better use of the land in terms of, of crops that could produce more. Um, and, and we just saw less places that were hospitable for bees. <clears throat> this was typical. Um, and over time, we just saw more and more of, of this. In particular, in the late 70s and early 80s, things like herbicides um, gave us these really pristine, beautiful looking fields, but it didn't leave us a lot of opportunity for making honey. And even along the edges of these fields, which were once dominated by weeds that have value to bees, um, they, were, they, were, they were gone and devoid of any vegetation that would support honeybees. The 80s were brutal. Uh, we saw a lot of drought. Um, honey prices were really low and crops were, were changing and farming methods continued to change. For bees, um, as they are depleted uh, nutritionally, they become more susceptible to pests and disease, and they, they lose the ability to, um, to live through the winter. And so we had higher mortality. And for the beekeeper, of course, we were feeding the hives more, and all of the other associated input costs were, were increasing. The yields were decreasing the losses were increasing. So it was a bad time. We came to a breaking point, I wanna say about 1982. Um, and we realized that we just weren't gonna make it. A hive of bees needed 200 pounds of, of honey or, or carbohydrates and 40 pounds of pollen or protein, all derived from, you know, from plants and floral structure just to survive. That was before we could take a single pound away from them um, to sell. So with, with depleting resources on the landscape, that was just an insurmountable challenge. It, it's important to note for this talk that, you know, when we're talking about what it takes for a bee to survive and, and what it takes to make honey, all of that kind of stuff, it need, you know, a hive of, of bees in an area that, that uh, has adequate uh, adequate forage or, or habitat, they're still needing to have about 2 million flower visits to make one single pound of honey. So when you think about that and needing a couple hundred pounds just to survive, that's a lot of flowers. So we wondered what we were gonna do. And I remember dad um, vexing about it and, and there was a lot of worry and he wondered if he could pass this business on to his kids. But then the almond growers called and it was, a, it was a, a change for us in, in our business and in our, our family life and our livelihood. Um, there was an opportunity to take bees to the Central Valleys of California to pollinate almond trees, which required honeybees to, to get enough of a crop to be viable. And this was a burgeoning industry with a lot of potential, but it was something that we had never seen or done before and it required that we become mobilized because our bees, as I described, were sedentary. They stayed in one place all year round. So 
dad, uh, dad went out and bought the finest forklift he could find. And that's my brother driving it. And we made some makeshift pallets to stack our bees on. And they weren't even all the same size and shape at that point. So we, we weren't really adapted for mobility. Um, but we adapted and we figured out how to do it. And that allowed us to find other opportunities as well. Not just taking the bees to California for almond pollination, but moving the bees from one crop to another, even in Southeast Idaho, to try to find better areas that were you know, better suited, sometimes only for a few weeks, because with a lot of, a lot of agriculture, um, with that in increased efficiency and, and harvest, and also with spray that's taking place, you know, especially, especially with insecticide treatments, bees need to be moved from one site to another. And so we were, you know, we were becoming bee movers as much as we were uh, beekeepers. And that continues. Um, being able to move the bees did allow us to survive and figure out how to get to the next generation in this, in this business. But it didn't help us to find uh, a way out of, of what was declining environment for bees. So in about 1999, we decided that we would venture out to North Dakota in search of better habitat. And North Dakota is, uh, I guess, most recognized as the best honey production state in the country. We've led the United States honey production for over 20 years. And there's more bees here in the summer than anywhere else. The reason why is because there's more habitat. So North Dakota was our frontier. And so we bought a business here and we picked up the larger portion of our operation. We moved, we moved to the Dakotas and we, we set up shop. And at this point, people are probably wondering what exactly is this habitat that we're pursuing? And you know, what, what is it that, that makes it um, desirable? Well, first of all, we have an insect that we work with that is very adaptable. And it's, it's e easily able to cover 8,000 acres from one site that's a pretty wide foraging range, and they can adjust to lots of different types of, of habitat. So anything that blooms, and I, and I say anything with kind of an asterisk by it because it's not, it's not completely true, but they are very generalist pollinators. So anything that, that they can find with copious amounts of nectar or pollen, they're going to go after. And they do all of that because their diet is complex. They, they need a lot of different uh, nutrition from, from the flowers in terms of pollen and nectar. And so they can, you know, they can get it wherever they can find it as long as, as, long as they can find flowers. Um, but we didn't, we didn't solve the problem because the same issues that we saw in Southeast Idaho over the last part of the 20th century began to occur here in North Dakota just after we arrived, sadly. When I uh, first put bees out in fields in North Dakota in the very early 2000s, corn fields other than for silage around cattle farms was very, very rare. And now it dominates the landscape in a lot of areas. So, so things changed here too, and we saw our honey production averages go from you know, 120 pound per hive range all the way down to about 50 pounds now. There are still areas of North Dakota that produce abundant uh, nectar flows and, and good honey crops, but they are, are further between uh, than they used to be. And metals like this one in this picture are rare. And this is kind of how bad it has become. In the country, we, we generally use about 600 million pounds. That's our annual consumption of honey. And beekeepers today are producing about 25% of that, or about 150 million pounds. And we have all moved to what was perceived as the last best place or the frontier. Um, the eight states with the most remaining conservation reserve uh, program acres have more than 55% of the bees during the summer. 
so there, there are a lot of um, consolidation efforts within the industry to try to find forage. And now we're, we're all realizing that even the, the last best place is depleted. So what in the world do we do about it? That was the question that, that we asked ourselves. Um, and I, I began to be involved in the beekeeping industry leadership in the early 2000s and at a meeting um, in Washington, DC with other stakeholders who were seeking answers to these same questions, I met Pete Berthelsen and other, other uh, interested stakeholders included farmers, ranchers, beekeepers, conservationists and policymakers, all trying to figure out how we can get more out of the scraps of land that are left. And what we realized was that there were lots of us and lots of critters that were also looking for the same things. So the same, the same um, things that we need on the land can be produced in a variety of different ways, a lot of, a lot of different places for a lot of different purposes. <clears throat> but what we need to do is we need to make sure that these efforts are adaptable so that we can maximize success. Um, we need to make sure that what, whatever we do on any, any acreage that is available for, for habitat is, is not only a, at a low cost, but has uh, the right components for all of the different species that need it and that can last throughout the, uh, the season so that there's always something there. This is what the habitat looks like to me and Pete and I and others agreed on that. And in uh, 2014, um, we co-founded an effort called the Bee and Butterfly Habitat Fund. And the idea was that we could bring this kind of habitat to a variety of different landscapes under a variety of different conditions for a variety of different benefits. And we have been working with, habit, with uh, landowners to establish this habitat for a few years now. We refer to it as the BBHF. And this particular project is in the CETA Legacy Program. I think I have arrived at the point where I should let Pete take over. And then I'll be glad to jump back in when we have some questions to answer. All right. Thank you, Zach. Um, <clears throat> this is the point in time when I want to reemphasize what Elsa said about um, putting your questions for us uh, when we're done tonight in the Q&A function on the bottom of the screen. Uh, give us your name, tell us uh, where you're from, and just pose us the question that you have. So Zach, before I jump into this, a couple of things of what you said kind of struck me. One, we don't have a, bunch, a lot of time to go really deep into it, but one of the things that struck me was when you talked about how you kind of uh, always handled your bees in one location. Uh, they basically wintered in the same area. I think people would be fascinated to hear from you. Where do your bees go in the winter now? Or, oh, I, I'll, I'll just quickly answer that, Pete. We store yeah. them in, indoors for a couple of months. And, uh, and that's to insulate them from a lot of the pressures that they would find uh, outside. And so once that's uh, accomplished, then we still load them up on trucks and take them to California. Yeah. And so one of the locations that you use are, uh, if I have it right, they're potato cellars. Is that correct? What Where potatoes were traditionally stored for the winter? Originally, yeah, that's that was their purpose. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And so you can maintain a con pretty much a constant temperature throughout the winter, kind of put them into a little bit of dormancy, but it's kind of like uh, wintering uh, as opposed to North Dakota. And the temperatures that you've had in the last couple of days, it's kind of like uh, going to a snowbird, going to Arizona almost uh, for the winter. Yeah, yeah, I was, <laughs> I would I mean? say so. We, we were at 50 below with wind chill and, and we don't ever let it get below about 40 in those sheds. So yeah, they, they're cozy. Yeah. The other thing uh, I'd like you to reemphasize, because you made the point, but <clears throat> I don't think many people understand it. You talked about, if I had the numbers right for what you said, as a nation, we consume 600 million pounds of honey. Was that the number? 
Yeah, that's and right. What, and what do we produce as a country? Roughly 150 million pounds or 25% of that. Yeah. So where does the other 75% of the honey that we consume as a nation come from? Yeah, it's, sadly, it's imported. Yeah. I, I think many of the people listening to our conversation here tonight would be like, what? How can that be? You know, maybe you're used to buying some honey at a farmer's market or that sort of thing, but we use all kinds of honey in commercial foods and that sort of thing. And uh, like you said, sadly, many of those come from parts of the world where maybe we wouldn't be as excited to know that it's coming from. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, I'm going to jump into uh, telling you a little bit about this entity that Zach kind of teed up called the Bee and Butterfly Habitat Fund, because this is what we think is one of our best solutions to touching all the things that Zach kind of laid out there. So the Bee and Butterfly Habitat Fund is a nonprofit that actually provides free seed mixtures on projects that are two acres in size and above. Uh, it's open to private land, public land, corporate land, which we hope you interpret as any land. Um, we it's a simple application process and we provide one-on-one -on -one technical guidance for the establishment, the design of it, and the future management of it. <clears throat> Zach uh, mentioned our flagship habitat program. It's not the only thing that the Bee and Butterfly Habitat Fund, but it, our flagship program is called Seed a Legacy. And that program is currently being offered in 12 key states in the upper Midwest and Great Plains. And if you're on the webinar tonight, you're watching this and you're like, what? Well, that's not available in my area. Well, know that when we started, we were in two states and then we went to six and then we went to 10 and now we're at 12. So we're having a very thoughtful uh, kind of steady growth of the program and we're coming to your area. But also remember that it's not the only, the Seed Legacy program is not the only thing that we do, but it's the primary flagship program. And these 12 states were selected primarily because of two overriding reasons. The first is their critical importance to beekeeping. And this is a map that kind of shows where bees move around uh, in their mobile world where, um, they're working on pollination services. And the other reason is that this is the part of the country that is critically important to the Eastern monarch butterfly population recovery. So if you're watching tonight and you reside in a location that is red, orange, or yellow, you are critically important to the monarch butterfly population recovery plan that we have in the country. So, how do we go about uh, doing habitat? Well, we do it in a really innovative and unique way in that every project that we work on receives two different seed mixtures. One that we refer to as a honeybee mix that includes uh, some of the clover species that are critically important, not just for honeybees, but native bees and many other species. And then the other one is called a monarch butterfly mix that is, uh, contains only native plant species, a minimum of 40 wildflower species, could be all the way up to 65. And uh, the honeybee mixture, the, the, the two things are separated because they, they function a little bit differently, particularly in how they're established. The honeybee mixture literally looks like this within two months, establishes very quickly, and is just kind of an absolute jump start to providing great pollinator health and habitat value. And the monarch butterfly mixture establishes slower. Sometimes we say that in year one, it sleeps, in year two, it creeps, and in year three, it leaps. It's a slower establishing project. Pollinator species use and benefit from both mixtures but they establish very differently. So we have innovatively designed our habitat projects uh, to come in two different flavors, two different seed mixtures. 
And this could be accomplished on a habitat project. If you're a landowner and you're thinking about, well, how would I do that? Here's a couple examples. Here's a six acre field and you could simply establish three acres of the honeybee mix and three acres of the monarch butterfly mix right next to each other. Or we could bring a little more innovation to it and establish it in a manner where the honeybee mix is established around the perimeter of the project and the monarch butterfly mix is established in the middle. That's done for a very specific management goal. And if you think of that honeybee mix like the moat around a castle, the honeybee mix can serve and function really well as a green fire break so that if we want to apply prescribed fire as a future management activity, we're more able to safely apply prescribed fire to that monarch butterfly mix. And also if you're listening and you're thinking, well, man, I'd like to do this, but I don't have two acres. Well, we try to be really flexible. Here's an example of where we would have a landowner that was able to come up with one acre and then across the fence, their neighbor can also throw in an acre. We combine those together to come up with two acres. One of the important messages that we want people to go home with tonight is we strive very hard that if the project has a high likelihood of having a, a significant, great pollinator outcome, we wanna to try to find a reason to say yes to it. So we try to be innovative and flexible in how we go about doing that. And uh, Zach and I and the rest of the biologists on the Bee and Butterfly Habitat team have seen for years anecdotally, we know this is having a significant positive impact and Zach's gonna talk about how it's impacted his operation a little bit later, but we are supporting four different research projects that are actually looking at and documenting what the habitat and pollinator benefits are from our seed mixtures. And I just wanna quickly show you one of those studies that was done with the US Geological Survey, where they looked at all the habitat that was available on the landscape, roadsides, pastures, grasslands, National Wildlife Refuge, and the Conservation Reserve Program, Pollinator Program called CP42, and the Bee and Butterfly Habitat Fund seed mixtures. And three quick results that we can show you is that the first thing we found is that Bee and Butterfly Habitat Fund projects had way more flowers in, twice as many flowers as the next best available habitat on the landscape. And it had about four times the value and visits by honeybees. We're pretty happy about that. But one of the things that we're perhaps the most excited about is the response that our native bees had to our pollinator mixtures, where it showed eight times the uh, visits and habitat use by native bees. Pretty exciting stuff. So <clears throat> that's just a really quick introduction, but I wanna show you that there are lots and lots of opportunities out there to collaborate with the Bee and Butterfly Habitat Fund. And we wanna show you what some of those are just to kind of get you thinking about this. Probably the bread and butter of what we do is work with private landowners. This is an example of um, a private landowner from the state of Minnesota standing in their Bee and Butterfly Habitat project 14 months after it was planted. And that looks, that looks pretty good. And if you remember my story about how it sleeps, creeps, and leaps, this is only going to get better. Another example of the types of projects that we're working on across the country, we're working with lots of municipalities that have things like wastewater treatment plants that are surrounded by grass that the municipality has to go out and perhaps mow every seven to 10 days during the growing season. We're working with many municipalities to convert those areas to pollinator habitat. The municipality saves the cost of the mowing uh, with their uh, budgets and we get great pollinator habitat on the landscape. We're working with many state 
and federal entities that manage public lands, like wildlife management areas to include pollinator habitat. Um, one of the areas with which we're really doing lots of work, currently projects in 23 states working to include pollinator benefits underneath the panels of new solar energy projects. And uh, that is an area that we see as really being a great opportunity to produce multiple benefits. Um, corporate campuses, this actually happens to be a project from the state of Iowa, where they elected to establish pollinator habitat associated with their corporate campus. And they are incorporating walking trails and benches and things for their employees to enjoy and benefit associated with their workplace. School lands. Um, here's a picture of a high school that we're working with that put solar panels on the roofs of their building. And it works so well that they said, we're gonna put some on some of the land associated with it. And again, we're identifying that area and putting pollinator habitat underneath the panels that will be powering that school going forward. Utility right-of-ways, another great example. There are literally millions of acres of utility right-of-ways, gas pipelines, uh, power lines that offer significant opportunities uh, not just for the pollinator habitat, but how it can connect different pieces of pollinator habitat. And that connectivity can be really important. Particularly, um, you know, Zach talked about the wide range and just the volume of area that honeybees can cover. Well, many of our pollinator species like native bees don't cover near that area. So the connectivity of being able to connect different areas of habitat on a right of way can be really important. Same thing with city parks, hike bike trails. Uh, we're working with lots of those areas and you can see many of the benefits here aesthetically and those sorts of things, but also for pollinator health and habitat. And I guess the final thought for, for my piece of tonight, and then we're gonna slide to taking your questions and we're really looking forward to those. My final thought, just to kind of um, loop back to Zach's point about how this can benefit all kinds of things. At the Bee and Butterfly Habitat Fund, we see pollinators as a really unique glue that can connect all kinds of issues. So as I show you the next slides, you know, probably most folks that are on here tonight, Zach, are pretty interested in honeybees. We probably have lots of beekeepers or people that are thinking about maybe I want to have bees. And so that's great, but there's all kinds of people in the public that maybe aren't interested in having bees. But I want to show you some examples of what this kind of habitat can connect to and work with. And I would predict that it these examples that we're going to give you right now will touch almost everybody that you would bump into at the grocery store, the Rotary Club, at church, those kinds of things. So Zach's done a great job talking about the importance of habitat and forage to his beekeeping operation. And we've already talked a little bit about how it's critically important to monarch butterfly population recovery. And I don't know who ranks out as number one or number two, but honeybees and monarch butterflies are clearly the number one and number two most iconically recognized insect species in the country. And they're both in trouble. And this kind of a project can produce significant benefits for them. But it also connects things like food sustainability. When was the last time that you took a stroll through the grocery store and didn't see terms like uh, free range, uh, non-GMO, grass fed, um, organic, and those sorts of things? Clearly people's buying habits and their preferences for food uh, are related to food sustainability and the efforts that we're doing can connect to that as well. Grassland songbirds, they don't get a lot of attention, but this kind of group of avian species that we call grassland songbirds have shown up to 90% 
population declines over the last 40 years. And this kind of habitat fills the need for what they're looking for and what is lacking on the landscape. Renewable energy, we talked about it a little bit already, but think about all the solar energy projects that are going in and how we could produce multiple benefits by just thinking about what that final vegetative cover is that happens underneath the panel and how we can design it to fit with all the objectives of the solar energy project, but also produce pollinator health and habitat benefits. Precision agriculture, we believe that there's room for conservation on every single farm and ranch in the country. And there's opportunities like what you see in the background of this photo, where we can take areas of a farm and ranch that either have a resource concern or are less productive and help reverse the return on investment on those acres. Water quality, who doesn't want clean water? We all do. And uh, very strategically placing pollinator habitat along the edges of our agricultural fields and helping to remove some of those agricultural chemicals or soil sediment from our water supply can have a really significant impact on pollinator health and habitat and our water quality. Same thing with soil health. And we've talked about right-of-ways and utilities. Just think if our 9 million acres of gas pipelines in the country uh, had pollinator habitat on them. Um, and then endangered species. If you don't know who this critter is, it's called the rusty patch bumblebee. And about two and a half years ago, it became listed as a federally endangered species act species. And the good news is, is that this guy, the rusty patch bumblebee is what we call a generalist. It doesn't have to have a specific type of plant. It benefits from high diversity, high quality pollinator habitat, just like we're establishing in Bee and Butterfly Habitat Fund projects. And I guess the, the last thought is that it brings together a very wide, diverse group of interests and people. And that's what we're working on. And I think we have a unique moment in time uh, with the public right now where there's an understanding that, hey, I understand there's problems with honeybees, monarch butterflies and other things. And that's an opportunity for us to really make a difference. So here's my last thought. If you are interested in establishing and managing pollinator habitat, the Bee and Butterfly Habitat Fund has produced a new guide to walk you through step-by-step step the establishment and the management of pollinator habitat, and it's available free of charge. And you can access this off of our website, it will provide you with step-by-step -step directions on really important factors to consider. And then on the webinar tonight, and I'm about to turn it back over to her, is Elsa Gallagher. She is our Habitat Project Coordinator. She provides that critical one-on-one -on -one technical guidance, and she is an absolute expert on this to help make that happen. So last thought for everybody listening as, as we get ready to turn it over to Elsa. And we're really looking forward to your questions tonight. Everybody that's listening to the webinar tonight can do something to make a difference. And I wanna give you four examples of what you can do. The first one is, is called gifts that grow. If we have something coming up like uh, a birthday, an anniversary, Mother's Day, um, Valentine's Day is gone, but remember us for next year, um, or a memorial, a friend that has passed away and you want to recognize and remember their life, we have an option where you can make a $100 contribution and the Bee and Butterfly Habitat Fund will establish a habitat project uh, in that memory. And you, when you go through the process, you will receive an e-certificate that you will present to that person to recognize their gift for their birthday or anniversary 
or whatever, and, uh, uh, and it makes a great gift. If you want to think about uh, giving a bouquet of flowers, that's nice. Lasts about five days. Think about giving somebody a whole field of wildflowers that we know is going to be there for a minimum of five years. That is a great way to make a difference. Um, if you're listening to this and you're thinking, hey, I, I got a, I'm part of a group or I know a bunch of friends that would love to hear a story like this, let's co-host a webinar like what we're doing tonight to get the word out a little bit further. Contact us through the Q&A and we'd be happy to set one up. If you also have some kind of a gathering or a meeting coming up where people would like to know more about it, let us know. We will send you a packet of flyers that you can hand out to let people know about our CETA Legacy program. And then follow us on social media. We're on all of the different platforms. And we also, uh, on a monthly basis, produce pollinator habitat tips, a short little three, four, five minute video that talks about a very specific aspect of managing habitat, establishing it, what are some great pollinator species to think about planting. And then again, we're on virtually all of the social media platforms that are out there. So give us a follow. And with that, here is some of the information to contact either Elsa or myself. And with that, Elsa, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thank you, Pete. Appreciate it. I'm gonna jump right in. We have so many questions that I'm just gonna jump right in without my usual jokiness. So <laughs> jumping right to the first question, Zach, here's a, a question from Maura that she asked early on in the presentation. Uh, she asked, is chemical free beekeeping no longer sustainable? Mm. What are your thoughts on that? It's, it's difficult, um, but not impossible. And we're learning, we're learning more and better ways to deal with the bromide, which is the reason why chemicals are used in beekeeping in the first place. Um, so that's, that's from within the hive. But when we talk about what they might be exposed to on the outside within agriculture or even within municipalities, um, it's very difficult to ensure that they won't have any exposure. Um, so it's not impossible, but nearly. Well, I'm going to ask Pete to follow up a little bit with that because you kind of went into the next question I was going to ask you, which, uh, let me pull that one up real quick. There are concerns about pollinator mixes being planted near agriculture fields. And that yep. would attract the pollinators and they're exposed to sprays. And Pete and Zach just, you know, alluded to that, that those sprays might be an issue. Pete, what are you, yep. what are your thoughts on that? <clears throat> well, number one, we have a pollinator habitat tip specifically on that subject that I would incur, encourage people to find. Here's my view that there are pollinator groups out there that suggest that any habitat located within 120 feet of agriculture doesn't really provide value. That's not the perspective that I have. I come to it with the perspective of, I'll take an acre of great pollinator habitat wherever I can get it, because we don't have enough of it, okay? My view is when we get an acre of habitat, it is supremely important that we make it the best acre that it can. Great. So um, on that note, then, Pete, making this the best it can be, how did the BBHF uh, come up with the idea of using two pollinator seed mixes? Yeah, well, <clears throat> I'm going to I'm going to uh, give my answer and then I'm going to turn it over to the architect of that idea, which is Zach. And I'll just say that um, in my wildlife biologist career, I've worked with lots and lots and lots of conservation programs. Elsa and I both have. And this is the only program that we know of that very specifically and strategically uses the two mix uh, platform to do that. And it just was a long discussion about how can we produce the greatest value for the greatest 
number of species. Honeybees, native bees, other pollinators, grasslands, songbirds, pheasants, quail, all kinds of critters. Our goal is to produce the best value for the most species out there. And this was our solution to that. And, and I want to turn it over to Zach because it was uh, really uh, his, his notion. Well, in essence, we had a really, really broad goal. And we, we wanted to benefit everybody and we wanted to, uh, we wanted to do it in a way that it could sustain all of these different species for all of their different goals for the entire season. And so that broad of a goal is hard to accomplish with one seed mix. Uh, mm -hmm. you, it's, it's like farming. Um, you know, a lot of the farmers in, in this neighborhood grow corn and soybeans, but they don't grow them in the same field. They separate them because if they were to put them together, they, they don't get along. Um, the corn would shade out the soybeans or the soybeans would suppress the corn yield to the point it wouldn't be profitable. So it's the same with habitat. Um, and when we're talking about very uh, long establishing perennial native species, they need room to grow. Well, some of the early establishing introduced species can grow in a very, very dense, quick way and provide optimal benefits within a short time, but they can't do it in the same, in the same plot. So we just separated that out and realized that we had individual goals and we could accomplish it better if we realized what nature was going to do. And so mm -hmm. it was that simple and it has worked well. I can, I can tell you from my own experience with these plots on my own properties here, that this is like returning to the old days of beekeeping when you have bees next to these plots. It's phenomenal. And it happens because we realize that we can get many different benefits if we allow all of these things to establish and grow as they need to. And so that's the, uh, that's the genesis with the two plots. Yeah, and, and Elsa, I would follow up with that and say that, you know, when, when we landed on this idea, it was like one of those aha moments. It's like, that's, it's innovative, it's creative, and it's really uh, going to be impactful. And Zach, I would follow up. Uh, you talked about how a honeybee, a honeybee's diet is very complex, and you know we, um, I, th I think of almonds as the example. Well, I think of uh, taking the bees to almonds as um, I go and eat at uh, Burger King for uh, two months in a row. And how does that work for bees? One 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 crop and that's what they're on. How does that work with the complex diet? <laughs> Did you ever see that, that um, um, documentary about the guy who ate McDonald's every yes. day? So it's yeah. kind of, it's kind of a monofloral diet and it's, it's healthy to the extent that it, that it can be, but there are things lacking and, and that's, what's important. And when we, when we built these projects, we had three goals in mind. It was, what we call the three D's and that stands for diversity, density, and duration. And those things are really, really fundamentally important because we have to have all of them in order to, to provide a complete diet for everything that we are intending it to be for, for the entire season. And so when you do that, you find that you got to have lots of different species that interact in a whole host of different ways. And the only way to make that happen is the way we have laid it out. Yeah. Boy, that's that's good. I remember Zach, you telling me once that I, I believe it was you that said something about taking the bees to California and putting them on the almonds, and then you take them home and try and get them fattened up on the good feed for the rest of the year to to make sure that they're healthy. And and it just it seemed like that was a real a stressor for them to to have to go do those pollination services yeah that's that's true elsa but it's not just the diet it's the rigors of transporting them and and exposing them to all of the of the other bees that are in that same small part of the world at that time and and then shipping them again you know it's kind of a stressful stressful job yeah. so they need good habitat to recover on and you know this yeah. this does help 
I've got a question, a follow up on that on that one that we just asked. Is it um, Kim says I always hear that we should only be using native plants for pollinators. The BBHF we just talked about that our two mixes include clovers. Does this in any way hurt the native pollinators to just to use the clovers? Yeah, so I'll I'll start on that one, Elsa. Okay. And the first thing that I would say is that if the goal that you have is prairie restoration, and I'm I'm a prairie guy. The photo uh, behind me is part of the native prairie that's located right outside a 95 acre native prairie that's located right outside the office. So I'm a prairie guy, but this this is not prairie restoration that we're doing. If, if we were doing prairie restoration, uh, number one on the what we call the monarch butterfly mix, it would need to be more like 150 or 200 species. So we think between 40 and 65 is really good uh, for what we're doing and we get a tremendous amount of value out of it. But we're absolutely thinking about providing the best habitat for the widest range of species that we possibly can. And part of that is on part of the projects we use uh, clover species because they have such phenomenal value, not just for honeybees, but for native bees as well. And that is well-documented. Um, if you uh, go and look at wild bee diets, when some of these clover species are around, they're absolutely using them. Zach, do you want to add anything oh, to that? Yeah, I have I have a couple of things to add, Pete. Um, first of all, I think that people need to realize that there's a there's a history to be considered in terms of honeybees and native bees interacting. Honeybees are not native to the to North America, but they've been here for 400 years. They've been here longer than most of the other plant communities associated with agriculture that we cultivate. Um, and throughout that history, there has been many, many years, in fact, 350 plus years of, of positive success uh, interacting on the landscape in much greater numbers. If you go back to the, to the 1950s, for instance, there were roughly twice as many domestic honeybee colonies in the United States and probably twice that many more that were feral colonies that were you know, living in trees and, and native pollinators were not in decline at that time. What has happened? Well, there's a common denominator and it's habitat loss. And so the competition that has happened between many species, not just honeybees and native pollinators, but many, many species is based on the fact that we have lost the ability to sustain these animals on the landscape because there's declining habitat. So when we recognize that and we have an opportunity to engineer habitat, we can do it in a way where we provide everything that a multiple host of species needs. And that's what we've tried to do with our habitat. You cannot get it done without proper diversity. And I think the most important thing to realize is that our, uh, our success that we've seen has been based upon multiple species using these, these plots. And the reason why they're doing that is because there's a lot there for them. So putting more food out there, in my, in my opinion, is you know, it's kind of the strategy that all uh, that the rising tide will float all the boats. And, and so more habitat will provide the opportunity for all of these things to succeed. And that will, in terms, reduce competition and stress. Yeah, I just, I wanna uh, put a red pin on what you just said there, Zach, because it's really the philosophy that the, the Bee and Butterfly Habitat Fund has. The rising tide floats all boats. And that is when we design the habitat and we make it the best it can be, we're gonna benefit that whole wide range of the most species possible. And Pete, on that note, um, what about small gardens? What about small plantings for pollinators? Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> I think this will be a good uh, two-part answer where I'll start and then Zach will uh, add to it. Remember that species like native bees 
and things like monarch butterflies and that sort of thing. Uh, native bees are not nearly as mobile. And uh, one of the things that we have found is that, um, <coughs> excuse me, is that things like uh, butterfly gardens and people's backyards and that sort of thing can be really impactful and positive. Honeybees cover a larger geography. So honeybees might have received a different answer, but I would say that um, smaller projects when designed properly can absolutely provide a significant value. Oh, I would agree. And I would also say that there's, there's additional benefits and value to having these, these projects in smaller plots where they can be. And one of those benefits is that it raises awareness of the value of those, of those plots. And it helps people to recognize that these things can be, can be cultivated in a variety of different places. They can take the place of, of uh, lawns, buffers and barriers, and even, even roadway strips that um, traditionally have just been well manicured lawns. And well, if you're, if you're a golfer, that probably seems really pleasing aesthetically. It has very little, little value to any of the species that we're talking about. So raising awareness and, and getting the stuff where, where it can be um, helps with, with that part of it. The other mm -hmm. thing I'll say is that it's surprising how much we can put into a little space. And in terms of uh, our hives, and we have, we have been putting hives on, on plots as small as two acres and seeing benefits in our apiaries. And so, you know, I don't know exactly what square is too small, but I haven't, I haven't seen it yet. So Zach, I wanna jump in and ask you a question because I think anybody that's listening that's like a hobbyist beekeeper like myself or is interested in getting bees probably wants to know how, how much of an area do I need? So the question that I wanna ask you is um, your experience as a beekeeper, um, what kind of, how many hives do you, can you put on, on one acre of something like what the Bee and Butterfly Habitat Fund is designing? Yeah, okay, well, that's, that's a really good question, Pete. We're still discovering the answer. I, I think I know roughly what it is under most conditions. And, and that's important that I say that because nature gives us a, a different entree every year to eat in terms of moisture and temperature and everything else. So uh, under most conditions in the Midwest, I feel like two acres. So the basic, the basic plots will, su will support a pallet of bees. And so you break that down and that's two hives to the acre. Mm. And I've tested this on my own property, um, more unintentional than intentional, but we have anecdotally observed that our hives do very well at that stocking rate. So again, two hives to the acre seems to be pretty productive. Yeah, I think, I think there's a lot of uh, hobbyist beekeepers that just leaned forward in their chair to listen <laughs> to that answer because that's something that a lot of people are really interested in knowing. And that, if I do my math correctly, which I do not always, that would be four hives possible on one of our minimum two acre sites, potentially, mm -hmm. if everything yeah. went right. That's great. Yeah. Well, gentlemen, I know we're, we're getting close to the end. I've got two more questions for you. I think we've got to ask this one because I've got three or four messages in here asking the same type of question. Um, and the, the gist of the question is, how do we speak to people about doing these type of plantings? And the background here is I've got at least three or four questions here about how do we talk to utility rights of ways? How do we talk to the city? How do we talk to other people about getting these plantings done? Um, so I thought maybe Pete, you could start with that and then we could maybe do some more. You know, yeah, you know, well, I think that. Zach will have uh, the best perspective but regarding uh, utility right of ways and municipalities and a bunch of those examples we gave you, most of those entities are already thinking about this. They honestly are. Uh, roadside managers, uh, municipalities, right of way entities, 
raise your hand and uh, go have a conversation with those folks and then connect them with an entity like the Bee and Butterfly Habitat Fund that can give them the technical guidance and oh, by the way, free seed uh, to do the project. And Zach, I, we're, I think that the other leaning forward in the chair perspective that people are gonna have is to hear your perspective on, on how that works. Well, you know, there's a couple advantages to being a beekeeper. And, and one, of the, one of the advantages is that, that lately, at least over the last decade, there's been a lot of interest from the public about bees. So there's lots of questions. But first and foremost, I don't know a single beekeeper that owns enough land to keep their bees on, if, if they're a commercial beekeeper anyway. And so we're guests on lots of different lands, whether we're there just to make honey or rest our bees after pollination or there to do some sort of a pollination service, we are interacting with landowners all the time. And so there is, is that opportunity wherein either with our dealings or during the general conversations that we have with those landowners, there's gonna be questions about how the bees are doing. And that's our segue and our opportunity to say, well, they could be doing better. We're missing, we're missing critical habitat around here. I had an experience a few years ago um, when we first got started with this program where we had a, a bee yard, we call it a, a, a bee yard, a, 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 an apiary site on a landowner's property. Um, and the bees weren't doing well because the landowner had removed about 800 acres of conservation reserve program land, which mm. was really why we had asked to put bees there in the first place, because it was loaded with, with lots of different things that the bees were doing well on. We took the bees back for a year after it was gone and we ended up feeding them. And so the following year, we didn't return. And I got a phone call from that farmer and he said, uh, you didn't bring bees to my property. Are you doing okay? And I said, yeah, we, we just needed to find a different place because they weren't doing well. And, um, and we, uh, you know, we have to make a living. And he was very concerned. He, he wanted to know what he could do. And that was the, you know, that was the aha moment for me is that, well, this is where we talk about habitat. So I told him about what we were doing and, and uh, he got in touch with the BBHF and we planted uh, habitat there and we brought the bees back and bees did great. <laughs> bees did better than they ever did before. And, uh, and so now, you know, I can share that success story. We've had many others since then. Um, you know, you, you can talk about this and people that's, that have a vested interest in having bees on their property are your, are your most interested people. Um, but there are others. And I, I think these kind of stories just need to be told. Yeah, and, and that was a really easy way to identify the benefit for your honeybees. But think about all the other benefits to all the other species, the native bees, the butterflies, the grassland songbirds, that rising tide floating all boats was occurring in that same situation. And that's, that's a really cool story. Well, gentlemen, we have gone to where we wanted to time-wise. We're at uh, 10 after almost. Um, so mm -hmm. I'm gonna ask one last question just to kind of put a bow on this, just for, uh, for Zach here. Um, what differences have you seen in your bee yards? that you've added the bee and butterfly habitat fund plantings to personally that, that you've actually done in person? Well, so the first thing that I'm gonna say is that, that I am so utterly convinced that this is the best thing that has come along in a long, long time is that we include a brochure about uh, CETA legacy in every, what we call rent package that we hand out to landowners. Now, I mean, we're, we're not going to miss the opportunity, even if we don't get a chance to talk to a landowner in the, in the course of the year's business, we're gonna leave a, uh, we're gonna leave a case of honey with, uh, with a habitat flyer on it at their doorstep, because this is making a huge difference for us. And I, I know that it's making a difference for everything else. I have two of these plots on my own property and you can't walk through them without kicking out a pheasant or a deer you can't walk through them in the summertime without seeing a host of different native pollinators and, and lots of different butterflies and our bees are doing well. It's absolutely the best thing that we've been able to, to do 
uh, since we and since we were in despair watching habitat just disappear everywhere around us, beekeepers are finally able to say, look, there's something we can do. If, if, uh, if we're gonna lose it on this place, then we're gonna build it over here. And that's a big change because for the, the majority of the 20th century, the, uh, you know, the technology led us to being able to move bees. But when there wasn't anything and there, were, there wasn't anything to go to and the last frontier was was suffering the same fate that everywhere else had already suffered. It was either figure out how to build it or we're gonna lose it all. And that's where we were. And this is an answer. It may, may not be the only answer, but for us, it's the best thing we've come up with so far. Elsa, I have two points to add as the period on the end of our webinar. The first is to Zach's point of the story he was just telling. When I talked about the different research projects that are going on with the Bee and Butterfly Habitat Fund, didn't have enough time to talk about them all, but one of them is um, a research project in the state of Minnesota with the University of Minnesota. And on the Bee and Butterfly Habitat Fund designed projects in that research study, last year they identified two new native bee records never before recorded, identified in the state of Minnesota, and they were found on Bee and Butterfly Habitat Fund projects. Is that not a cool story that goes back to the, uh, if you build it, they'll come kind of story and the rising tide floats all boats. And my last point is, now you know why I think Zach is one of the smartest people I know. This has been a great webinar. And I thank everybody uh, that has been on here tonight. And thank you, Elsa, for moderating this. And if you liked what you heard, you'll be able to listen to it again because it's recorded or have your friends listen to this or maybe that municipality or the right of way people, have them listen to this webinar and get as excited as we are about this uh, effort. And and we will answer those questions that we didn't get to tonight. We will follow up with you. We will get those answers to you. We thank you all for participating tonight. Thanks, everybody. Good night. Thanks. Good night.